The 2020-2021 season of Nat Talks is made possible by presenting sponsor, the Downey Family Foundation and media partner, KPBS, the public media station serving San Diego and Imperial counties. As a final reminder, uh, normally we'd have automated subtitles. We'll be looking into our closed caption options and make sure that if you catch a recording later on, you might be able to see some closed captioning. Now, we are very excited for tonight's speaker, Dr. Yuvia Renteria Flores. Again, Yuvia's talk is the summer edition of the 2021 Climate Series presented with Climate Science Alliance. To catch up on the other talks in this series, visit the Nats YouTube channel, which is posted on the chat. You can also learn more about Climate Science Alliance using the link that you can find in the chat. Dr. Yuvia Flores Renteria is an evolutionary ecologist at San Diego State University, and she studies the evolution and ecology of species with binational distribution, aka plants that are shared by California and Baja California. She looks at the interactions between plants, insects, and microbes, as well as how climate change affects those interactions and the evolutionary consequences. She earned a PhD in 2011 from Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico, studying the ecology and evolution of Mexican pinion pines. From 2011 through 14, she did postdoctoral research at Northern Arizona, Arizona University, studying evolutionary ecology of Pinus edulis. From 2014 to 16, she was a research fellow at the Hawkesbury Institute for Environment and Western Sydney University, working on psyllid-induced defoliation in eucalyptus. Since 2017, she has been an assistant professor at San Diego State University. And welcome to Yuvia. Hi, um, can you hear me okay? Um, I cannot turn on my video. Do you guys need my video or? We can hear you, Yuvia. And okay. um, if you can't use your video at the moment, we can see your presentation. Okay. Okay, so you can see my presentation and the video is not, um, you cannot see me, so it, it's, that's okay. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, here we go. Still, I, I don't think I, I see my video, but maybe you can see me now. Uh, if you can see me, just let me know. I cannot see myself, but um, I'm very, very honored to be here and very happy to be sharing my research with you. Thank you, uh, Justin, for the introduction, and thanks, Em and Anna, for the invitation, and also thanks, the NAT and the Climate Science Alliance for making this um, series of talks about climate change. It's very important to be talking about these topics. And Yuvia, we're just going to interrupt for one moment. We need to switch off the, the main slide of our sponsors. No problem. Keep on, keep on, on trucking. Uh, that is on Yuvia's slide show. Thanks, Justin. Great. Thank you. Um, OK, so all good? All good, Nat? We're good. OK. We are good, and we can see your video. Thank you. Oh, fantastic. Good, good, good. So the first thing that I want to ask you is by ask your favorite to close your eyes and maybe take a deep breath and think on your nicest memory of a tree, right? So just pause for a second of your very heavy day or whatever you're doing and just remember that. Okay, now open your eyes and if you feel comfortable with your experience in the uh, chat, I, if it's not working, um, put it in the Q&A and we could look at it later just as for curiosity. Maybe you were thinking about that very special day that you were reading a book and you fell asleep under the shade of a tree, or maybe the day that your children or grandchildren were climbing that beautiful tree in the back of your yard. Maybe it's just the serenity that uh, being around trees gives you, or the beauty in the right um, picture in your screen, you can see this eucalyptus uh, rainbow eucalypt and look at the bark it's just beautiful it's majestic so regardless of what you you were thinking just want you to realize that we have a strong connection with trees 
either because we rely on them for food, for house, or just for an adventure. And we're not the only ones. So trees are foundation species. And what that means is that they have a lot of interactions. So in this, in this figure, you can see trees. And these circles represent different species. And the lines represent interactions. So trees have more lines with other species. And these species depend upon trees. What that means is that trees structure the communities above ground and below ground. And without these trees, the ecosystems will collapse. So this is happening, unfortunately. This is the mortality happening around the world. And this is an already old map from 2010. This is a publication from Craig Allen and collaborators. They were mapping the mortality, massive mortality of trees around the world. And those are depicted by the red dots. As you can imagine, over the last 10 years, this, this map has become redder. And, and well, in this case, we have multicolors representing all of the mortality. I got this from the Tree Mortality Network that's available. And um, they are collecting the information from different um, publicly available data. That means also reports, documented information. That means that this, the mortality of our trees might be even higher because a lot of, of times the mortality is not documented into papers. And yes, so the mortality is happening for a multiple reasons but mainly the usual suspects are drought and heat. And it's really the combination of drought and heat that makes it deadly. So drought has been uh, extensively studied and usually the studies focus on drought and survivability or the mortality. And heat is, has been, is, it has become more obvious that heat, heat plays a very important role. I put this figure here for you this is um, eucalyptus marginata, and these species are very, very resilient. So these are trees that are adapted to very extreme conditions, and they are dying. And they are dying because of the combination of drought and heat. So climate change, and in particular, I'm talking about drought and heat, affect ecological factors and also evolutionary factors, and they can be direct or indirect effects. And in the ecological factors, you can think about reproduction, for example, and that will affect the birth, but also the survival, maybe growth and deaths, but also the dispersal rate, how the pollen and the seeds are moving around can also affect how the seeds get established, germinate, and then start growing at the very early stages. Also the species interaction, and that's less evident, right? These are interactions between trees and maybe fungi or the pollinators, the relation that some trees has with other plants or with the herbivores. The other set of, of factors are evolutionary, and in that, I would like you to think at, at, about climate change as a selective pressure that these populations of trees are experiencing. So now imagine a forest with trees. And in this forest, some trees have genes that might confer drought tolerance. And if we have a drought um, period uh, or, or heat wave, some of these trees are going to die, and then you're going to be changing the genetic frequencies into the future, but also maybe the phenotypic frequencies. That means how the trees look. That's the phenotype. And what I would like to argue is that these factors are coupled. They are interacting um, closely together, the ecological and evolutionary factors. So this is uh, taking us back to our, our map that I mentioned before. And I'm going to be talking about three different species and I'm giving you my the ideas and our the knowledge that we have collected about the importance of different aspects 
either ecological uh, or evolutionary. And the first one is going to be pinion pines. So we are looking at this dot right here. And this is a picture kindly shared by Craig Allen. In this, you can see the pinion pine forest or the pinion juniper woodland in James Mountains near Los Alamos. And this is this picture was taken in 2002. And if you remember, 2002 was very, very um, um, drought, dry. And then in 2004, you can see the skeletons. So all of these trees died. Some of them didn't. And guess what? These are junipers. So junipers, we used to think that they were very, very resilient. But as I was uh, collecting information for this talk, I ran into this, this Twitter by Drew Pelletier. And he just posted this picture of widespread mortality in junipers around Blackstaff, a place that I love with my heart. So that's really, really difficult to see. Um, all of these trees die, and even the, the more resilient ones. Going back to our pinion pines, they produce pine nuts, and they are beautiful trees and delicious pine nuts that I love, but also the um, blue jays love, and the promiscus, these rodents love. And also, they are at the core of the Navajo culture, it's super important. And you might be familiar with them if you have eaten pesto. Sometimes they use these um, pine nuts. And yes, it is a foundation species that interacts with a lot of different species above ground and below ground. It's dominant in the Southwest. In, in here, I'm, I'm showing you the distribution of these species. And the right, we have this map that has the distribution of pinocedulis shown in, in uh, yellow, right? So it's uh, present in Arizona, in Utah, in Colorado, and in New Mexico. And on the left, in the left graph, you see a model. So Kenneth Cole and collaborators make this model based on climatic um, variables only. And what they predicted is by the end of this century, we will have um, areas in brown represent high mortality. So it will be all extirpated. That means all killed, no trees in all of the brown areas. The blue represents areas with no change. And the green is very thin and narrow. I don't know if in your monitor you can even distinguish it, are areas with little expansion. So not a bright future for this species with the predicted model. However, if you go back to the map on the right, you could see that in red, we have areas in which mortality occurred from 2000 to 2007, high mortality levels. And if you compare some of these areas, like this one near Santa Fe in New Mexico, are areas that were supposed to, know, to have no change. They are areas in blue on our left map. So I think we are missing something. We, if we want to understand the future distribution of this species, we are missing uh, things. And the things that we're missing uh, that need to be incorporated in these models are the ecological and the evolutionary factors that I mentioned before. One of them is about reproduction. So reproduction, it, it's the pines need wind to get pollinated. And this, I, I got it from one of my students, Ryan Bock shared this with me. Um, this is not pinocedulis, but pines in general shed the pollen like that uh, with winds. And, and the question is, is reproduction susceptible to heat stress in this species? Before we go into the results, I want to give you a crash course uh, about reproduction in this pine. So the pine around April, will start producing these shoots. And if you look at the tip, they start emerging some buds. These um, one month later, more or less, will form these structures. They are called estroboli. They are kind of similar to flowers, but we're talking about angiosperms, I mean, gymnosperms in here. So these are called the stroboli. And these are the female stroboli. That means that they have ovules in here. 
female strobolites. At the bottom, we have the male strobolites and they release pollen. And this pollen, this is a magnification of these little pollens, they look like this. And if we let them go with the wind, they will land into a pollination drop. So the ovules are inside of this structure and they produce a pollination drop that gets absorbed later and the pollen gets closer to it. And then it starts germinating and then it will fertilize the egg later on. And after eight, 17 to 18 months, since the formation of these little structures, we'll have these mature cones full with um, the pine nuts, and then the, the disperser can come and disperse the seeds. Okay, this is the experimental design. Uh, we did this in Flagstaff or near Flagstaff, Arizona and Sunset Crater. And in this area, we have a very interesting elevational gradient, the sharp, sharp transition. So at this altitude, this is the altitude at 1600 um, meters, we're talking about meters here, we have juniper. This is dominated by juniper. The temperature is lower, and then we have the pinion pines. And as we go up in elevation, we have the ponderosa pine. What we did is that we collected pollen from different localities, and then we brought it to the lab. We store it at four degrees Celsius, and then we mimic the, the conditions that the pollen experience. So let me go back a little bit. So I talk, talk to you about the pollen getting dispersed by winds, and that is the DS, dispersal stage, the DS. And then the pollen gets um, absorbed and germinates. That's the germination stage. So we're talking about two different stages here, and those are the ones that I'm, I'm representing here. The dispersal temperature is when they are moving in the, by the wind, and 30 degrees is the optimal temperature that has been documented that the pollen will, will be viable during the, the reproductive period for the germination. 35 is kind of the average temperature that we were thinking of the higher temperature that we were thinking um, they will experience. And 40 was kind of the predicted um, temperature that these trees will experience in the future. However, 40 degrees Celsius is already, it has been already documented in, in, in this area. And then we have this reciprocal design with the germination temperature on the right. So the same temperatures, 30, 35, and 40. So let's take a look to some results over here. At the bottom of this graph, we have the dispersal stage, the dispersal temperature. We have, if you remember, the four degrees, that's the bridge temperature, and then 30, 35, and 40. And what you could see here in this graph is that there is no difference between the fridge or 30 or 35. The, the pollen is viable equally. But when we reach 40 degrees, they decrease. They decrease badly. This is the pollen that germinates at 30 degrees. And this is the, the pollen tubes. This is this isn't petri dishes, but in nature, they will be growing inside of the ovules. OK, now let's take a look to the rest of the graph right here. Now we have the different germination um, temperatures because it's reciprocal, right? So we have the 30 that I explained already. We have 35 and 40. And again, when we reach 40, most of the pollen is not viable. And in the pictures, is it's easier to understand. So if you germinate at, at 30, you have very nice pollen tubes with the cytoplasm, that's the, the content inside of the cell. At 35, the pollen tubes are shorter, but they, they germinate it. But the cytoplasm is not very dense. It's not very rich. And at 40, definitely, you don't have these little, little things, the pollen tubes. So definitely, um, the higher temperatures that the trees are experiencing affect reproduction. And that's one of the not very visible, right? So these pollen grains are very um, microscopic. So not visible. Now let's jump into biotic interactions. So biotic interactions and in particular herbivory. 
the first interactor that I want to show you uh, associated to these three is this moth. This is called Diorithia bobitella. And what this moth does is that it eats the terminal shoots of the, the tree. Right here, you can see it in this, in this picture. And it makes a tunnel, right? And actually, it's not the moth that does that, but the larvae. This is the larvae that eats it's the, the pine. And what that does is that it makes trees that look like Christmas tree, convert them into shrubs. However, Thomas Whedon uh, recognized this phenomenon, that there were some resistant trees that always looked like Christmas tree looking, and others that uh, were shrubby, that they were the ones susceptible. OK, so in the left, we have a picture of Lake Powell. And this is just to show you how intense the drought was in this period, if you have forgotten. This is the level of the water in the same picture uh, of the same area, but you could see how lower the water was um, by 2004. After this period of time, what happened to these two moors is in, in, impressive because the, res the most resistant trees died a lot higher than the most susceptible. And that's super interesting. So basically, we can use herbivory as predictor to drought tolerance, right? So this morphotype dies uh, more than twice compared to this other one. And most trees die, most, most trees that die are moth resistant. And you can see that in this picture. So the ones that look like shrubs are green, and the ones at the back right here are, are the ones that are the most um, moth resistant are dying. OK, for the next part of the, of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the biotic interactions, and that is the plant and fungi, the interaction with fungi. And that's going to help us to understand why we have this phenomenon that I just explained to you. So trees and fungi make mycorrhizae. And mycorrhizae are, um, it comes from the Greek. Myco means fungi and rhizae means roots. So they are fungi that are going to be interacting with the roots. And this is how it looks. So if we cut the tip of the, the tree, we'll see something like that. This is, these are the mycorrhizae. And in this interaction, this is a mutualistic interaction, so everybody wins. The plant gives to the fungi carbohydrates from the photosynthesis, and the fun fungus gives in return to the plant um, nutrients and also access to water. So it's a win-win, beautiful. And you can see in this picture, seedlings, when they are inoculated with a mycorrhizae, uh, they grow better than when they don't have this fungi. This has been uh, led by um, my colleague and dear, dear friend, Dr. Catherine Guerin. And so we are doing this together. And one of the questions that we have is, are there microbial differences between trees, between these two trees? And what we found is that trees that are um, moth resistant are dominated by Basidiomycota. Basidiomycota are fungi that belong to one large division of the fungi, the fungi group or kingdom. Um, and the other one, the, this other morph over here, um, the moth susceptible, is dominated by Ascomycota. So in the graph, you just see the percentage of, of fungi that are associated to these to different morphs. So it's very interesting that these morphs are associated to the two different types. The ascomycota are the cup fungi. And regardless of the morph, if you are associated with the cup fungi, but in particular to members of the genus Geophora, the growth will be higher. So this graph on the x-axis, we have the percentage of geophora associated with the roots of these trees. And in the y-axis, we have the shoot length. 
and you see this positive relationship, right? So the more job for you have, the, the better you grow. So very, very easy to, to look. In this region around Sunset Crater, we have five different types of Jopora, and we only knew them from the mycorrhizae. And later, in 2011, I believe, um, we found some fungi growing, so, so the sporocarp, so that's the protein body, the, the structure that is going to form the spores. And we documented everything that we could. Uh, this is the, the mycorrhizae. So I was telling you, it's the tip of the root. It's surrounded by a lot of hyphae. Those are the, the threads of the fungi. We did some genetic analysis, and we found that it was one that has been already documented to be very beneficial to these trees. And we named it uh, Geopora pinionensis in honor to be um, to these, these pines, because it's, it's a host. And they have this very interesting association. OK, so fungi are very beneficial to these, to these trees. We need to look into that a lot more to help save these trees, OK? Now, let's talk a little bit about the evolutionary factors. And for that, I want to talk about the inheritance. In this, in this slide, I want to show you um, the communities, the fungal communities of the mature trees represented by these circles and the seedlings are represented by these squares. And in this graph, we see that the symbols, if they are closer together, that means that they have more similar fungal communities. And if they are more further apart, that means that they, they have more different the fungal community. So what we see here is that regardless of the inoculation type, so these um, seedlings were grown and then inoculated with fungi from uh, different morphotypes, so from both morphotypes. And at the end of the day, the seedlings that were offspring from one morphotype, in this case, the moth susceptible, ended with the same fungal community as their mothers, and same with the other um, morphotypes. So that suggests that, yes, there is something, um, there is a, an inheritance going on in this. And that happens also in the, in the mortality. The offspring from, from these guys, from the moth susceptible, tend to survive more than the offspring from these other guys, the moth resistant. And this is what we have in this slide. Um, so the mortality of adults, we have covered it before, and the seedlings tend to have the same the same uh, response with the drought uh, intolerant mothers having um, or seedlings from drought intolerant mothers surviving more dying more sorry than comparing to this other morphotype. Now let me talk about the evolutionary factors, um, but beyond the one is the, this species. And now I'm going to be talking about hybridization and. When we talk about hybridization, some people don't like talking about hybridization or there is this stigma about hybrid individuals. And I hope that we can change that because hybridization can be detrimental, but also can be very beneficial in some cases. So I already have mentioned the distribution of Pinus edulis. Pinus edulis has two needles per fascicle. That means two leaves all bundled together and it's distributed in, in these four states, shown in yellow. And Pinus monophylla, it's, uh, it has one needle per fascicle, so I can, you can see them or see it here. And it was assumed that it had all of this distribution in, in red. And it, it was all the way to Baja California in these scattered populations. However, um, later studies or more, more recent studies have shown that monophyla is actually, it has a more narrow distribution than previously thought, like now in red in here. And if we look at the morphology, that will explain it a little bit. Now, let me, let me explain this better. If we cut this leaf of this pine in half, 
we'll see this it had this shape and these little holes in here are the resin canals and these resin canals are very viscous and and smell very nice so these have two and this um species pinus monopola has an average four now this variety has two but it has one needle per fascicle right and this other one has multiple it has like a more than 10 and it also has one needle per fascicle so that's why people used to call this uh the one needle pinion pine but now we think that this is different and what is interesting is that people think that this one over here it's called um phallax the phallax type the one that occupies the distribution in orange could be uh, just a variation of edgeless that is plastic. So that means that it just, depending on the conditions, it might express this form or this form. But other thing that is probably the uh, hybridization between monophyla and edgeless that result in this morphotype, because then we have the two needle, the two um resting canals but just one needle so that was uh, an alternative for to explain this now over here as i was saying we have californiarum uh, in blue so it's hard to see because you might be able to get confused with the c but there are very tiny populations all scattered we have californiarum in san diego and in san diego county for sure this is very important to, to study because the average temperature of edulis, now represented in orange, is five degrees lower than the average temperature of the phylax type. And so if you look, this is closer to Phoenix. So, well, some of these populations. So these, these populations are already experiencing hotter temperatures and maybe higher drought compared to edulis. So really understanding how the gene flow between these two uh, taxa, um, if anything, it's very important to understand if naturally these species can contribute to the survival of Pinus edulis. This is what we are trying to understand in our lab. First, trying to understand if they hybridize, what groups they are, and later in the future, we hope to identify more um, details on this phenomenon. So these are the, the four species that I presented plus Pinus quadrifolia. And Pinus quadrifolia overlaps in distribution with Pinus californiarum. So now Pinus quadrifolia has its quadri of cuatro, quadri, um, because it has four needles per fascicle in general. Is represented now in purple. So we are included five different taxa in our study. And this is being done by um, my student, Ryan Bach, a PhD student in my lab. So we are looking into, into this question of the rapid evolution by hybridization on phase of climate change. We have collected a lot of populations throughout the whole distribution of this species. And this has been a lot of, of work that has been done in collaboration with people from NAU and we keep doing it. Um, we have to thank a lot of people helping us and allowing us um, the permits to collect in all of these sites. These are the results. This is a facet structure analysis and this is a genetic analysis that we, we perform a lot in my lab. What that means, different colors mean different genetic ancestries and in the context of this presentation you can understand it as different species this analysis has hundreds of individuals and each line like right now if you look at my mouse if hopefully you can see my mouse um, there is one individual right here so every line is a different individual so the best analysis um, suggests that we have four four species in, in this group, in this complex. Quadrifolia, the one with four needles per fascicle represented here in purple. Then we have Agilis in green, Californiarum in blue, and 
in red, we have monophyla. They have hybridization. For example, pinus quadrifolia, some individuals are, are the result of mixing quadrifolia and monophyla, right? Or over here on the right, we have individuals that have a proportion of the genetic ancestry from edulis, the one that has the two needles per fascicle, and monophyla. And if you look at this area in the middle, we have a lot of individuals that are the uh, admixture of Pinus edulis and also Pinus californiarum. Those are the green and blue colors. So individuals that have these two colors are actually individuals that are phenotypically considered phallax. So that's why I'm putting here the phallax type now and over here as well. So green and blue are phallax. So this analysis suggests that phallax is the result of hybridization between edulis and Pinus californiarum, not monophyla as, as once it was um, hypothesized. And also that californiarum is definitively a different um, species, not as a subspecies of monophyla, for example. So this data is very conclusive. The other thing that I want to mention is that Again, as I was putting together this, um, a friend of mine and a colleague, Tom Overbauer, um, shared with me some uh, sad story about these pinion pines. This is actually Pinus californiarum, we believe, um, are dying massively in the pinion mountains here in the San Diego County. So Tom brought this, I hiked up well peak last Wednesday, and it appears that of the nearly 900 acres of what was forest, more than 95% of it is dead. It was disheartening. So it's, it's really difficult to see all of these images, um, but, but hopefully we can come up with some solutions. So this is it's happening. So in summary for this part of this, remember I'm gonna be presenting you three different species, and the first one, the summary is this, reproduction is susceptible to heat stress. So the fungal communities con contribute to drought. So this is a big news because we need to be looking at the fungal communities that are providing resilience to these trees and helping them. And we also think that gene flow uh, from uh, drought tolerant species, for example, phallax, um, genes from phallax moving into edulis might help with um, increase the survival of pinus edulis. We really think that incorporating all of this knowledge of drought genetics could improve conservation and, and the planning of conservation. Okay, and in that case, we need to select trees that or genotypes that are drought tolerant. And that will be uh, a way to, to, help, to help the forest. Our next uh, species is this over here. And I added this, this, this wasn't in the original study. This was uh, reported in 2012. This is Eucalyptus molucana over here in the Sydney region of Australia. And this has been defoliated by a sealet. And you can see here the trees, the massive mortality. So this is the, this is the tree of, uh, well, this is a cartoon. And you can see that this, the, this plant is host or is a habitat for a lot of the iconic animals in Australia. And they are very, very cute animals, but also it is um, host or habitat of this psyllid. This little insect over here is a, a machine killer, but this is native. The, the interesting thing is that it is native to this region in Australia. Okay. So I'm gonna be talking now about biotic interactions and in particular herbivory in this species. The whole species, the tree of uh, Eucalyptus molocana, distributes along the coast, the east coast of Australia, uh, represented by the 
blue dots all down here. And what these three does, I mean, the three, no, the, the silly does is that it has a proboscid. It, that's like a, a tongue that it sticks through the, the stomata and that's a little force in the lips. So the stomata, um, it's open and the silly just inject the, this proboscid and sucks the sap of the tree. And that does, it doesn't hurt in smaller numbers, but when it gets in the really large numbers, that can be an issue. So how does this work? Um, we, when we have higher temperatures, the psyllid can reproduce um, faster because the metabolic rate gets increased. Um, so the, the psyllid usually has one to two generations per year, but with, with hotter temperatures, it can be up to four generations per year. And usually in normal conditions, the psyllids crash during the winter because they don't handle cold temperatures. But then if the temperatures go up, the psyllid can pass the winter in massive numbers and keep reproducing the following year, okay? And then what does that represent to the tree? Well, as I was telling you, the, the psyllid sucks the sap and the tree as a defense mechanism drops the leaves. It do, drops the leaves. And if it happens over and over again, the tree will die. So these trees are very resilient because they resprout. So some of these leaves over here in these trees are the, the resprouting. Those mechanisms are not present, for example, in, in pinion pines. So these have already an advantage, these eucalypt trees. And the, yeah, this um, I've been doing this with um, some friends and collaborators from the Hawkesbury Institute um, for Environment in Australia. And one of the goals that we have was to test whether the psyllid has a specificity to Eucalyptus molokana. And for that, we made a common garden experiment in which we um, collected samples from these trees along the whole uh, gradient, the whole distribution, but also include other close relatives. So Eucalyptus molokana, I was telling you, it distributes in the East Coast, but it's also um, suggested that it has four different subspecies. And they are represented here in different colors. So Crassifolia, Queenslandica, Peticillata, and Molokana. So they are all subspecies or considered sub subspecies of Eucalyptus Molokana. Then we have a, a, another level of, of hierarchy and that's called the supraspecies. And there are these four species, Eucalyptus Molokana, Microcarpa, Albens, and Wolsiana. And these four, are very difficult to tell them apart. And that's why they are considered superspecies uh, for some authors. And then we included other close relatives. So we have them over here, these close relatives. Um, and this is the distribution um, that we have for all of the species. And what we did is that we grew up the seedlings, we germinate them, we put them after two, almost two years of growing them we have saplings, we put them in, in, in nature. And in this forest, this was heavily defoliated by the psyllid. And the psyllid here, uh, we can see some results. We have the different species and the psyllid has high specificity to Molokana. So uh, more than 80% of the seed, uh, the leaves and the different saplings have the, the psyllids in Eucalyptus Molokana. The superspecies, the, um, these four, four species right here. So Wilsian and Alvens have some uh, attack, but was very minimal. Microcarpa didn't have anything. So definitely it's a high specificity. And this is the psyllid with some of the eggs. So we were counting eggs. So a lot of fun, a lot of, lot of work. Which was kind of surprising is that the, the superspecies in the north, here represented in purple, um, high more percentage of X compared to the ones at the south. And as if you remember, I was saying that the outbreak happened in Sydney. 
And I'm a little bit worried that the outbreak can go outside of Sydney because if it happens, the northern populations are more susceptible to this, um, the attack of distillate. And quickly just wanted to touch on the evolutionary factors and talking about hybridization again and these species. So these uh, eucalyptus are, are well known by having uh, hybridization. And in, in this study, um, this, is, this is preliminary, but we know that in the Sydney region, this eucalyptus molokana or gray box has hybridized with a variety of species. But in particular, I'm interested now in looking at the hybridization that it has with eucalyptus albans, or this, um, this is a little bit whitish, right? So that's why it's called albans. Interestingly, this species in this region, eucalyptus molokana has hybridized higher or in higher proportion um, with albans compared to the northern, northern populations uh, of the Sydney region. And what that means is, if you remember, Alvins was a little bit susceptible to the silit, but not a lot. So it will be interesting. The ne next step will be to look whether this hybridization is actually conferring some type of silit resistance into eucalyptus molokana. So to, summar to summarize this uh, second example, um, silit susceptibility um, has or the, the different eucalyptus have different susceptibility. And they have a lot of specificity for eucalyptus molokana, but the northern populations, such as the ones coming from the Queensland stage, uh, have higher susceptibility. And we definitely need to look at the consequences of hybridizing with a close relatives, such as eucalyptus albans, which might have reduced the silic susceptibility. Okay, so let's take a, a, a one second break before we jump into our next um, example. And this one is this oak. This is um, by, um, I think I'm blanking on this side. I think it's Pine Creek right here. It's, um, I just passed it through last Monday. This is the Coast Live Oak. And so we're talking about an area here in San Diego County. This is a project that I'm doing in collaboration with a lot of very nice people. And uh, we are trying to work on the resilient restoration. And the purpose is to advance ecological, but also cultural and the community resilient with tribal nations at the core of our project. And at the bottom of this slide, you can see all of our partners. So it's a very large project and very, very exciting with a lot of very smart and, and nice people. And I'm so honored to be part of this, this work. So we, we want to work with the tribal communities. I, I was saying we don't want, we are working with them and they are the core of this work. And we, we talk to them and include a lot of different aspects in this project. So we talk about the ecological modeling and the genetic analysis. We also um, work on projects and actions to create these resilience and resilient uh, ecosystems, but also work on outreach, education. And again, everything is at the core of the tribal, tribal communities. It's not surprised that one of our focus is this oak, the coast light oak, because it has such important cultural importance to the tribal communities. In here, on this, in this picture, you could see the metates. And metates are rocks that have been used to grind the acorns. So these are the acorns, the seeds of the oaks. And you can grind them. And after grinding them for hundreds of years, you can have a very deep hole and then you make flour uh, and you can make cookies or cakes or whatever you want. They are not only important for uh, the tribal communities and, and humans, but um, also they are cows and food source of very iconic animals such as the acorn woodpecker, the California ground squirrel and the scrub jay. Unfortunately, oaks 
have been experiencing a lot of threats, such as Phytophthora, which is the Southern Oak um, Death, the Gold Spotted Borrower, the, another borrower over here, um, this fungus, and obviously clearance. And all of this is exacerbated, if not as a result of drought and high temperatures. And that's because plants usually have natural defenses, but when they have a stress, drought and high temperatures are stress stressors, they won't be able to defend themselves. And we're experiencing a lot of those in, in California, drought and high temperatures. So Coast Live Oak, it has been used by 12 different tribes in California. Um, it also grows in, in the north of Baja California and it's dominant uh, in the chaparral and the pine oak woodlands. It has two varieties and this is actually very interesting to me. Um, we have this variety Agrifolia. It, it reaches the north of Baja California but it's not shown in this map. And the other one is more restricted. This is variety Oxiadenia. It's very restricted to this area in San Diego County and also in these in these points over here in Riverside. Um, the different morphologically, they are different. And if you look at these leaves, the variety Agrifolia is glabrous. What that means is that it doesn't have these hairs that on the picture on your right has. So it's whitish because we have these um, very dense hairs. So this is the, uh, the difference, two different varieties. You can think also on the variety of Sardinia. It has more inland distribution, which might be more, um, it might be hotter, right? Compared to the more coastal distribution of the variety Agrifolia. So we want to know, one of the other questions is whether the variety of Oxiadenia is more drought tolerant. And also we would like to look at the genetic diversity on different populations. And, and that's because populations that have more genetic diversity are linked to populations that are able to adapt to new environmental changes. And all of that, um, when we identify what variety or what populations are more resilient, we can make some plants to save those um, these trees. So our plan, and we started this already. So we have germinated the um, the seeds. These are the acorns. This is the root emerging from the seeds, and we're germinating. This is Carlos Portillo helping us um, every every almost every day watering these plants, and they are growing beautiful. They are our babies. A lot of them germinating, 83% germinated. That's a, a really nice number. We planted uh, over 2,000 acorns. We just started again this project, um, and they are four months, uh, no, more, more than four months now. Um, but yes, so, so what we are going to do once that they get completely established is that we are going to subject, subject it to drought tolerance, to a drought, a drought experiment. So we're going to reduce the water and we'll see which ones um, are doing better compared to comparing the two varieties, but also the different populations and families. This is one picture just showing how beautiful they are when they are babies. This is after four months and it's already almost 10 centimeters high and growing, growing. So we need to work together to save our trees. And, and if I want you to take something um, back home is that we need to work with our local communities and, and work together. We cannot do this alone, not education on by its side and, or you're planting just one tree. We really need to work uh, together and we need to work fast. I want to talk about the acknowledgements, but I, I guess I don't have that much time. And obviously I'm missing uh, some people. This has been a lot of help from, from a lot of people. And now I would like to jump to questions. If you have, I have one question for you, if you can put it in the panel, in the um, Q&A, is that what do you think you could do to help save our forests and our trees? And thank you very much for listening.